Welcome to Cerebral Faith Live. I'm Evan Minton, and today we're going to be continuing our um, series on the Sermon on the Mount. And last week we looked at the Beatitudes, and we're going to be moving on to the issue of salt and light. Um, if you are watching live, leave your comments in the live chat, and I will get to it in the Q&A after the fact, after uh, it is all over with. Uh, if you are not watching it live, if you are watching it on, uh, if you're listening to it rather, on the Cerebral Faith Podcast later on Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, uh, or what have you, um, then <laughs> you can't leave your comments in the live chat because it's not live. Uh, but if you are watching it right now on YouTube, uh, then leave your comments in the live chat. So, without much further ado, I will share my screen. Um, hold on. And there we go. It's exegeting the Sermon on the Mount, part two, being salt and light. So the series outline so far is we uh, did the Beatitudes last week, and uh, tonight we're going to be looking at what it means to be salt and light. Uh, and then next week, next Saturday, because I'm doing these every single Saturday, uh, unless something comes up, but for but for the most part, 90, at least 99.99% .99 of the time, these are going to be on Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 7 p.m. Central. Uh, next Saturday, we're going to be looking at Jesus' attitude toward the Old Testament law. Then the Saturday after that, we're going to look at anger's, uh, anger and thought crimes. And the Saturday after that, we're going to look at what uh, the heart of a... Oh, hold on. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. I've got this thing working now. Okay. So let's get into it, finally. That only took like eight minutes. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. Quote, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. End quote. That's Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. Audience window. No idea of knowing because I can't see both of my screens at the same time. Anyway, D.A. Carson writes, Salt and light are such common substances. Confer Pliny, Natural History, 31.102. Nothing is more useful than salt and sunshine, that they doubtless generated many sayings. Therefore, it is improper to accept a tradition history of all gospel references as if one original stood behind the lot. Confer Mark chapter 4, verse 21 chapter 9, verse 50, Luke chapter 8, verse 16, Luke chapter 11, verse 13, 33, and Luke chapter 44, verses 34 to 35. Salt was used in the ancient world to flavor foods and even in small doses uh, as a fertilizer. Confer Eugene P. Dietrich, salt soil savior, uh, who wants to test Gaius to read for the soil, not of the earth. But notice the parallel of the world in Matthew 5.14. Above all, salt was used as a preservative, rubbed into meat. A little salt would slow decay. Strictly speaking, salt cannot lose its saltiness. Sodium chloride is a stable compound. But most salt in the ancient world derived from salt marshes or the like, rather than by evaporation of salt water, and therefore contained many impurities. The actual salt, being more soluble than the impurities, could be leached out, leaving a residue so dilute it was of little worth. 
In modern Israel, savorless salt is still said to be scattered on the soil of flat roofs. This hardens the soil and prevents leaks, and since the roof serves as playgrounds and places for public gathering, the salt is still being trodden underfoot. Dietrich Salt, page 47. This explanation uh, negates the attempt by some, for example, Lenski Schneiwand Groscheid, to suppose that precisely, people with weird German names, uh, to suppose precisely because pure salt cannot lose its savor, Jesus is saying that true disciples cannot lose their effectiveness. The question, how can it be made salty again, is not meant to have an answer, as Schweitzler rightly says. The rabbinic remark that what makes salt salty is the afterbirth of a mule, mules are sterile, rather misses the point. The point is that if Jesus' disciples are to act as a preservative in the world by conforming to kingdom norms, if they are called to be a, mis a moral disinfectant in a world where moral standards are low, constantly changing, or non-existent, they can discharge this function only if they themselves retain their virtue. Tasker, end quote. Did the slide change? Yes. In his book, Studies in the Sermon on the Mount, Dr. Moy, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, quote, he says, ye are the salt of the earth. What does that imply? It clearly implies rottenness in the earth. It implies a tendency to pollution and to becoming foul and offensive. That is what the Bible has to say about this world. It is fallen, sinful, and bad. Its tendency is to evil and to wars. It is like meat, which has a tendency to putrefy and become polluted. It is like something which can only be kept wholesome by means of a preservative or antiseptic. As the result of sin and the fall, life in the world in general tends to get into a putrid state. That, according to the Bible, is the only sane and right view to take of humanity. Far from there being a tendency in life and in the world to go upwards, it is the exact opposite. The world left to itself is something that tends to fester. There are these germs of evil, these microbes, these infective agents and organisms in the very body of humanity, and unless checked, they cause disease. This is something which is obviously primary and fundamental. Our outlook with regard to the future must be determined by it. And if you bear this in mind, you will clearly see what has been happening during the present century. There is a sense, therefore, in which no Christian should be in the least surprised what has taken place. If this scriptural position is right, then the surprising thing is that the world is as good as it is now, because within its very own life and nature, there is this tendency to putrefaction, end quote. He goes on to say, quote, the Bible is full of illu endless illustrations of this. You see it manifesting in the very first book. Though God made the world perfect, because sin entered, this evil, polluting element at once began to show itself. Read the sixth chapter of Genesis, and you find God saying, My spirit shall not strive with man. The pollution has become so terrible that God has to send the flood. After that, there is a new start. But this evil principle still manifests itself, and you come to Sodom and Gomorrah with their almost unthinkable sinfulness. That is the story which the Bible is constantly putting before us. This persistent tendency to putrefaction is ever showing itself. Now that obviously must control all our thinking and proposals with regard to life in this world and with regard to the future. The question in the minds of many people today is, what lies ahead of us? Clearly, if we do not start by holding this biblical doctrine at the center of our thinking, our prophecy must of necessity be false. The world is bad, sinful, and evil, and any optimism with regard to it is not only thoroughly unscriptural, but has actually been falsified by history itself, end quote. With regards to that last sentence of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I suspect, now I've read the, the whole book, I've read this entire book, I know I know what this quote is in its context. The context does not it still leaves me guessing as to what he might mean by our prophecy by necessity must be false if we don't keep this biblical doctrine at the center of our thinking. I suspect what he means is end times prophecy, and he might he may be making a subtle jab at a millennialism. This is the this is a view of the millennium that I hold. Um, it's 
Uh, a millennialist like myself interpret Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 6, which mentions Jesus reigning for a thousand years prior to the ultimate defeat of Satan, as, as the Wikipedia article briefly summarizes, Quote, pertaining to the present time, a belief that Christ currently reigns in heaven with the departed saints, end quote. Wikipedia notes that, quote, such an interpretation views the symbolism of revelation as referring to a spiritual conflict between heaven and hell rather than a physical conflict on earth. A millennialist do not view the millennium mentioned in Revelation as pertaining to a literal thousand years, but rather as symbolic, and see the kingdom of Christ as already present uh, in the church, beginning with the Pentecost in the book of Acts, end quote. Now, I know it's Wikipedia, but I'm an amillennialist, so I can say, yeah, this is, this, this is the view. This is adequately represented. Now, I do believe that Jesus will physically return. He's going to come back in his human body, and he will physically reign in this world. But the kingdom of God already arrived in the first century. It's just not fully inaugurated. It's like a mustard seed that was planted as a, it was planted as a tiny sect of just 12 Jewish men and their rabbi, their rabbi king, the God man. And it has been growing larger and larger. The kingdom of God has been growing larger and larger over the past 2,000 years. And it's going to eventually become this gigantic tree at the second coming. Um, amillennialism holds that the world is getting better and better rather than worse and worse. Now, if you look at the state of the world today, if you watch 24-7 news cycles and you spend a lot of time on social media, you might think that such a notion is ridiculous. School shootings are more common in America now than they have ever been in the entire history of this country, as far as I can tell. I mean, we get like, what, maybe four or five a year? We we get, I mean, that, there was a time when something like Columbine was just unheard of. And now I, I hear of another school shooting and I've kind of become desensitized to it. I mean, it's not that I, I don't, it's not that I have no feelings of compassion. It's just that I'm not surprised by it anymore. It's like, oh, there's another one. That's really sad. It's just, it's no longer a shock. It's like, what? Somebody went into a school and shot it up? Really? It's like, it's commonplace now. You And you practically can't let your children play outside unattended because child predators, kidnappers, um, sexual morality seems virtually non-existent nowadays. Not to mention that for the past 50 years, it was legal to slaughter children in the womb. Prior to the most recent Supreme Court decision, we had a holocaust, which was several times larger than that which Hitler infected, inflicted on the Jews. In fact, the holocaust that Hitler inflicted on the Jews was extremely tiny when, in comparison to the amount of infants who were killed, in, uh, babies who were killed in utero. I shudder to think of how high the mountain of skulls would ascend. But so you think, gosh, the world is just absolutely horrible. It's been getting so much worse over time in my lifetime, even. But we need to think of the history of humanity as a whole, not just the past the past 50 years in this country. We need to have a better, a wider outlook. The church has indeed been a preservative to keep the world from festering and to light, and it has been light to illuminate the evil in the world. Um, and I will get to that, I will get more to how the church has actually been making the world a better place since the first century. Now, uh, now we'll discuss the, the nature of Jesus's illustration of light. R.T. France, in his uh, Tyndale New Testament commentary on Matthew, says, quote, Light, like salt, affects its environment by being distinctive. The disciple who is visibly different from other men will have an effect on them. But the aim of his good works is not to parade his own virtue, but to direct attention to the God who inspired them. By doing so, the disciple will give light to all, confer Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Jesus is preeminently the light of the world, John chapter 8, verse 12. 
And as Isaiah had prophesied of the servant, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. But this role passed to his disciples, confer Acts 13, 47. The city set on a hill, rather awkwardly introduced among the sayings about light, reinforces the importance of being conspicuously different. A bushel, a grain of measure of about nine liters, put over an oil lamp would probably put it out, so that the meaning could be that a lamp is not lit only to be put out again. Jeremiah's PJ pages 120 to 121. But the emphasis of the passage is on non concealment. Confer Mark 421, Luke 816, under a bed. So again, the scientific implication need not be pressed. A secret disciple is no more use in the world than one who has lost his distinctive his distinctiveness in verse 13 your father who is in heaven is a favorite expression in matthew and reflects a major emphasis in jesus's teaching in earlier jewish thought god was generally the father of israel rather than of individuals though this phrase was coming into use by the first century a.d in the latter sense end quote So we can see that salt and light are basically two sides of the same coin. The salt preserves society and keeps it from becoming worse. Light actually causes improvement. Salt keeps things from getting worse. It keeps things from decaying. Light illuminates things. It, it makes things visible. It brings light to a dark place. So there's a negative aspect and a positive aspect. And we are we as Christians are to be both. Um, they're two sides of the same coin. the The world is decaying, so it needs something to preserve it. It's dark, so it needs something to light it. Jesus is the light of the world, and we, as those who are being conformed to His image, are to reflect His character. Here's how the church has been salt and light in the world. It has been making the world a better and better place over time, even if the morality of the culture fluctuates in localized places at certain short intervals in human history. First is the ingraining of the idea that all life is sacred into the cultural mindset. Former professor of sociology, Dr. Alvin Schmidt, notes El Elwood's couple. Elwood Coverley's observation that the biblical teachings of Jesus Christ challenged, quote, almost everything for which the Roman world had stood, end quote. This is uh, what he said in his book, How Christianity Changed the World, on page 44. Dr. James Kennedy writes, quote, life was expendable prior to Christianity's influence. In those days, abortion was rampant. Abandonment was commonplace. It was common for infirm babies or unwanted little ones to be taken out into the forest uh, or, the, or the mountainside to be consumed by wild animals or to starve. They often abandoned female babies because women were considered inferior, end quote. This is from What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, pages 9 to 11. The Romans promoted brutal gladiatorial contests where thousands of slaves, condemned criminals, and prisoners of war mauled and slaughtered each other for the amusement of the cheering audiences. Roman authors indicate that sexual activity between men and women had become highly promiscuous and essentially depraved during the time that Christians appeared in Roman society, and that pedophilia was rampant. Men having sexual relations with young boys was not uncommon or even looked down upon. This is in uh, Schmidt's How Christianity Changed the World, pages 79 to 86. Women were very lowly regarded. They were given very minuscule amounts of education and weren't even allowed to speak publicly. Again, in Schmidt's work, pages 97 to 102. But as Christianity spread and more and more of the Roman world became followers of Jesus, gradually society began to change. The Bible teaches that all people are made in God's image. It, this is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. And ergo... All people are created equal. All, pe all people are made in God's image. Therefore, all people are created equal. We are all representatives of God in his cosmic temple. 
Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27 says, quote, God created mankind in his image, male and female, he created them, end quote. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says that because mankind is made in God's image, anyone who murders another human being is to be given the death penalty. The Imago Dei is a major reason why murder is a capital offense. You, When you murder a person, you are desecrating one of God's images, one of the images of God. Human life is sacred. As the U.S. Constitution put it, quote, all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with inalienable rights, end quote. Secondly, because all humans have equal value, humans should not be the property of other humans. Christianity led to the abolishment of slavery in the West. Now, it is often... It is often uh, alleged by skeptics. Hold on. It is often alleged by skeptics that because uh, that that um, Jesus never spoke out against slavery, and neither did Paul, and therefore Jesus, God is okay with slavery. Um, and in fact, the Old Testament regulates slavery, doesn't speak out against it at all. Let me take a moment to respond to this objection because I know it's going to come out up either in the live chat or in the comments section. First of all, slavery in the Old Testament was totally unlike slavery in the American West. When people hear the word slavery today, they immediately think of the kind of uh, slavery that took place in the United States in the South just a few, uh, j j you know, a couple centuries ago. Black people were bought and sold like property. They were considered by the law to be inferior human beings or not human beings at all. There were laws in place in the Old Testament to prohibit the abuse of slaves, uh, whereas such laws did not exist in the United States uh, in, in the context of American slavery. And in practices of slavery, and it's not present in practices of slavery still practiced around the world today. For example, Exodus 21, 16 reads, quote, whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death, end quote. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. Anyone who was kidnapped and forced into slavery was given a, a harsh penalty. God did not approve of people being forced into slavery. He disapproved of it so much that capital punishment was dealt to those who broke this law. However, in modern slavery, no such punishments exist. In fact, this is how practically everyone nowadays becomes a slave, by being kidnapped and forced into it. But in... Israel, that was not how a person was to become a slave. And if anybody made a person become a slave by kidnapping him and forcing him into it, he was to be put to death. It was a very serious crime. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 14 to 15 says, quote, Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset, because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you, and you will be guilty of sin. End quote. According to Exodus chapter 21, verses 16, uh, 26 to 27, if a slave was injured by his master, the slave was to be set free. Moreover, if either a free man, Exodus chapter 21, verses 18 to 19, or a slave, Exodus chapter 21, verses 20 to 21, is injured, the one who caused the injury must pr provide care for the victim. Slavery in the Old Testament era was more like a welfare system. According to, the Old Te according to Old Testament scholars, back in those days, people would often voluntarily sell themselves into slavery, which actually, and by the way, that's not really a good term. A better term would be indentured servitude, but I digress. But they would put, they would 
get themselves into this situation because they were so poor they couldn't live off of what they made. Becoming a slave or a servant would provide the person with shelter and food provided that they worked for their master. This is clearly a better alternative than being homeless and hungry. But it still wasn't a fun situation to be in, which is precisely why people resorted to it as a last resort. It wasn't the worst thing in the world, given that it provided people food and shelter, To, uh, but it wasn't the ideal situation. After a certain amount of time, they could leave they could, they, or they could stay if they had become attached to their, to their master. This is talked about in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 40 to 49. This was a reasonable option for people who did not have a desire to uh, overwork themselves just to make ends meet every day. So they sold themselves into this service. Another point I want to make is that in the New Testament era, Paul exhorted slave owners to be kind to their servants. I remember one time, back when I was still on the uh, dumpster fire of stupidity known as Twitter, uh, some, uh, a blogger called Godless Mom tweeted a, a picture, it was a meme, that showed open hands of an African-American person. And the, uh, the caption said, God is good with slavery. Uh, and that was on top. And the bottom was a quotation of Ephesians 6, 5. I knew immediately that the scripture was taken out of context to make the Bible and God look bad. So I pointed out in a response that she completely ignored that uh, the seeming harshness of this passage is softened when you look at the context of the passage, which, you know, the new atheist types, they don't like to do that. They don't like to read Bible verses in context uh, because then it would debunk uh, their claims. Here's the whole context of that verse that uh, Godless Mom put in her uh, tweet. Quote, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do. Uh, whether they are a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that uh, their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. End quote. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Paul exhorts slave owners to be kind to their slaves. Moreover, at one point, Paul told slaves to win their freedom if it was possible. If they can, Paul essentially says, if you can win your freedom, do so. But if you can't, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal, but do it if you can. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21. Paul didn't condone slavery in this passage, but merely gave slaves guidelines for how those in the first century culture, uh, the first century Greco-Roman culture, were to behave while in their slavery. Context makes a world of difference in interpreting what the Bible says. Okay, now with that out of the way, uh, the in his book, R Rabbi on the Mount, how Jesus' Judaism clarifies the Sermon on the Mount, Phil Weinger writes, quote, Professor Rodney Stark of Baylor University, in his book How the West Won, argues that Christianity contained the ideas that lifted humanity out of that dead pattern and created the modern world. He lists quotes from 19th century historians declaring how the West descended into darkness for centuries after the fall of Rome and then explains that 21st century historians now regard such statements as a complete fraud. Europeans, following the fall of Rome, were better fed, taller, and healthier than their Roman counterparts. And technology, education, commerce, and art thrived in the European world after Rome. Furthermore, he argues, the ideas of Christianity led to the abolition of slavery. The rise of liberal governance, innovation in free commerce, and attention paid to human virtue, all of which gave the West advantages over other civilizations. He's not alone in saying so. I came across a podcast from a popular show in Britain called Unbelievable, in which one of the guests, a secular historian named Thomas Holland, explained how he had come to regard his view of the irrelevancy of the church as wrong-headed. 
Holland's specialty is late antiquity, particularly the Romans and the Greeks. As he dug it, uh, as he dug into Cicero, he began to recognize that Cicero's Roman world was truly alien to him. He reflected on the fact that Julius Caesar had killed a million Gauls and enslaved a million more, all to advance his political career, and that Cicero did not regard this as evil in any way. He saw the same alien character in the Greeks and in early Islam. They accepted things as normal that many mo any modern person would reject as horribly evil. And he began to realize that virtually all of the things that explain modern sensibilities could be found not in the Roman Empire, not in the Greek philosophers, nor anywhere else in into, into antiquities, but in St. Paul's small set of letters. There he found the backbone of Western morality and expectations. Thirdly, Christianity gave rise to the scientific revolution. As C.S. Lewis put it in his book, Miracles, a preliminary study, quote, men became scientific because they expected law in nature, and they expected law in nature because they believed in a, leg a legislator, end quote. To further look at the uh, impact of Christianity upon the world, the cat was scratching on something. Uh, I recommend these three books here, Dominion by Tom Holland, How the West Won, The Neglected Story of the, uh, the Triumph of Modernity by Rodney Stark, and How Christianity Changed the World by Alvin J. Schmidt. Now, at this point, I want to address a, an, a common objection here that Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16 contradicts Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 4, uh, this is where Jesus says, you know, don't do your good deeds before others to be seen by them. Um, when, you, when you give to the needy, do it in secret. When you pray, go into, go into a secret room, close the door behind you, and pray. And then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Uh, doesn't this contradict this passage, Matthew 5, 14 to 16, where Jesus says, uh, let your light shine before others so that people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Are we supposed to do good works in front of others, or are we supposed to do good works where no one can see them? It, it doesn't, that, this seems to be a contradiction. Do, but it isn't a contradiction. In Matthew 6, Jesus is condemning doing good in order to show off and make yourself look good. It's It's doing good in front of others for the sake of glorifying yourself. It's that's it's a sort of look at me, look at me, look at how good I am, look at how spiritual and religious and moral I am. Look at look at all these good things I'm doing. I, I'm feeding a, I'm feeding um a very skinny child in a third world country. Let me take a selfie of it and post it on social media kind of thing. Uh, whereas in Matthew 5 Jesus is saying do good so in order to draw attention to God. It's all about motive. It's all about what's in your heart. Why are you doing good uh, before others? Is it to draw attention to God or is it to draw attention to yourself? And so there really is the contradiction is only prima facie and superficial. Now, here's how we can be salt uh, and light in our own lives. Um, the church is salt and light in a corporate sense, but we are to be salt and light individually as well because the church uh, the cor is a corporate body that is, co that is comprised of individuals, and the body would be nothing without the individuals. First is show people that you care. Go out of your way to help other people out. If someone is struggling through financial times, maybe this person you know is struggling to pay a bill or two, help them pay it. If they can't afford groceries, help them out. Or if they're going through something difficult, like the loss of a loved one, the loss of a job, or whatever, maybe they just need someone to talk to. In that case, be a shoulder for them to cry on. I've been in these circumstances before. Back in 2017, uh, my family and I were struggling with finances, and we, we couldn't pay uh, the property tax because we had let it go for too long, and it had, it had gotten up to something like... 
500 600 um and we thought we were going to lose our house but fortunately i started a gofundme page and within a single hour one hour all of my brothers and sisters in christ uh mostly most of whom i knew mainly online came flooding in support um god provided for me through his children a year later, I had a similar problem uh, with a well pump that needed fixing that was also very hefty up in the price range. Uh, started another GoFundMe page, and again, my brothers and sisters rushed to my aid. Sadly, in the context of an otherwise beautiful story, uh, a weed that Satan had planted among the heads of the grains rose up and tried to slander my good name as a result of these only two times that I have ever needed help. I consider him to be an enemy, a wolf in sheep's clothing, and I consider him to be hellbound. But that's a story for another day. Also, this YouTube channel was made possible by another apologetics YouTuber. I'm not going to reveal their identity. They asked me not to. Uh, so I'll just leave it to you to speculate as to who that, who this person might be. Um, they did this totally unsolicited, didn't ask for it. They just, op they just sent me a Facebook message and offered <laughs> to, to do this. Um, they lent me their old MacBook Pro. And he said, hey, you know, I'm getting a new computer, and it's stronger than my old one. Um, why don't I just wipe this MacBook clean and just mail it to you free of charge? I, I jumped at that chance because I really couldn't afford, a, like, what well, it's like 12000 It's like $1,200 or something for a, a powerful uh, MacBook that strong strong enough has high enough specs to edit videos um so yeah i jumped at the chance because the acer i had at the time really wasn't strong enough to handle video editing it crashed all the time um so yeah now i'm speaking of what other people have done for me i don't want to i don't want to try to come up with examples that i have done for other people because i don't want to fall into the trap of Matthew chapter 6, which allegedly contradicts Matthew 5, but we saw that it really doesn't. Um, but I'm go I'm going to brag about the good deeds of my brothers rather than my own. I don't, I want to um, not toot my own horn. I'm going to keep, if people see my good deeds, they see them. If they don't, they don't. Uh, but anyway, sometimes just showing people you care, helping them out, that can be uh that that's that is letting your light shine before others and letting your light shine before others can be really just simple as just showing a willingness to help them uh you can tell them if there's anything i can do to help you let me know uh, even if they don't take you up on that offer at least show your willingness show that you are willing to help them out another thing is don't worry about your sodium and luminosity levels we can be so intent on being a preservative substance in the world, we can be so intent on lighting up the darkness in this world full of depravity, uh, of depravity and, and dying sinners, that we might, we might go too far out of our way to do good works in front of others. The danger of this is that we might fall into the trap that Jesus talks about near the beginning of Matthew 6, about doing our good works in order to be seen by others. In other words, we might fall into the trap of, look at me, look at me, look at how Christian I'm being, look at my attitude and my conduct, look how, look how good I am, look how godly I'm being. <laughs> um, and even if our motive, here's the thing, even if our motive remains pure, even if the motive is to draw attention to God rather than ourselves, nevertheless, other people might not know that that's our motive. They might think, wow, look at that person. Try, he's trying too hard. He's trying to be overly pious. They might think that we, or they might think that we're being, we, they might think that we think that we're better than them. Um, and that will have the opposite effect. That will turn them off to the gospel. The simple solution is just this. Focus on following God. 
focus on obeying to him, pray to him, study his word, and try to obey his commandments to the best of your ability. Just focus on the two greatest commandments that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 to 40, to love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Just focus on these things, and you, as a result, will be sufficiently salty and sufficiently luminous. Be in a proactive relationship with your Heavenly Father, and He will reproduce His character in you. Be in a proactive relationship with your Heavenly Father, and He will reproduce His character in you. By the way, if you have questions, leave them uh, in, in the live chat, and I will get to them at the beginning, uh, at the end of this uh, slide presentation, which took too long to set up. Thirdly, evangelize. St. Francis of Assisi once said, quote, preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words, end quote. I have not read Assisi's works, so I can't comment on what he might have meant by this in context. However, I do know how others have taken his words, whether he actually meant it this way or not, others have taken his words to argue that we should just live moral and godly lives without ever opening our mouths or really saying anything about God. We should just live good and godly lives, hope others notice how different we are from other people, and then when they ask us uh, why we're such good people or why we're so filled with joy, then bam, we're off and running. Uh, we can start talking about, we can start sharing the gospel now. This is a terribly ineffective evangelistic method. As a Christian teenager, I found this really attractive because I was socially awkward and introverted. Now, I still am a little so a little awkward and introverted to a certain degree, but I've, for the most part, come out of my shell since my teenage years. Uh, and I can specially come out of my shell when the situation calls for it. But the idea, back then, like the idea of just going up to a stranger and initiating a gospel conversation terrified me. So I thought, oh, this is fantastic. Uh, I just I just have to like live a really good Christian life and then just wait for people to come up and ask me about it. Um, and, and then I thought, well, if anyone gets offended, I can say, hey, you wanted to know what it was about me that made me different from other people. Don't get angry. I'm just giving you my answer. Um, unfortunately, I waited and waited and waited, and no one ever came up to me and asked me, why are you so different from other people like they were supposed to? And now I have what I like to call Jeremiah syndrome, where if I don't evangelize in some capacity, I will burn up, I will burn from the inside out, from the center, my heart is on fire. So I couldn't wait any longer. Eventually, I had realized, to heck with this, I'm taking the initiative. And now I know that that's what you're supposed to do. You see, we are to preach the gospel with both words and our lives. If you only use words, but you live an absolutely ungodly life, people will call you out as a hypocrite. On the other hand, if you live a good moral life, but you never preach, people will just think, wow, what a really swell guy. And they will leave it at that. Wow, that's a, that's a, Ted is a really good person. He's he's just the nicest guy I've ever met, and he's always so happy. Uh, wow. Um, your words and your life need to work together. Words, your life, together. That's the recipe for effective evangelism. If you simply stick with one or the other, you won't be making any disciples. You'll either be an obnoxious hypocrite, or you'll just be a really great guy, but nobody will really know why. If you want to lead people to repentance, preach the gospel at all times, use words, and live a godly 
life. First, uh, let's look. At, let's take a look. Let's take a moment to look at some parallel passages to Matthew chapter five, verses uh, thirteen to fifteen. First Peter chapter two, verse twelve. Did I say? Oh, parallel passages to Matthew five, thirteen to fourteen. First Peter chapter two, verse twelve says, "Quote: Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong." They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us, end quote. First Peter chapter 3, verses 15 to 17 says, quote, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, end quote. This is the famous apologetics verse, 1 Peter 3.15, along with the next couple of verses. We need to be sure that when we give a defense of Christianity, we do it with gentleness and respect. Don't be a jerk. If you are being a jerk... You're just going to turn people away. Now, I realize some people will be offended no matter how nice you are. People who don't want Christianity to be true because uh, it would mean that they would have to forfeit their sinful lifestyle. They would have the uh, they would have the dichotomy of giving up their sinful lifestyle or facing damnation. They don't want to be faced with that dichotomy. So they would rather live in the delusion that there is no hell. There is no dichotomy. Uh, people who don't want Christianity to be true for that reason, they will face you with the utmost fury, no matter how nice you are. Um, and I have been on the receiving end of some new atheist ire. They they are they are mad. They're like, yeah, yeah. Apologetics definitely prepared me for retail. Uh, <laughs> Now, again, I want to give a disclaimer that not all atheists are like this. And not all atheists are atheists because of their sin. I understand that. I understand that there are indeed true skeptics out there. There are true skeptics and doubters who, if they were just given good reasons and evidences for Christianity, they would be convinced and they would become Christians. These kinds of skeptics, uh, I think, usually eventually do become Christian. They are the Lee Strobels, the C.S. Lewis's, the J. Warner Wallace's of the world. So don't misunderstand me. I don't, I don't mean to brush all atheists or even all non-Christians in general with such a wide brush. But a desire for it not to be true is indeed, I think, a psychological reason for hostility on the case of many. Not all, but many. Others might be hostile because they've ha just had bad experiences with Christians. Hashtag can relate. Uh, or they've had bad experiences with the church, and so they're just naturally inclined to hate us. But if you, are, if you go into a discussion being extremely rude, toxic, condescending, aggressive, pe that will turn people off. People's defense mechanisms turn on when they feel like they're personally, when they personally are under attack. Uh, I often worry about this when it comes to my young earth creationist brothers. They treat their fellow Christians very badly just for taking a different view on Genesis 1, just for thinking the earth is old and or thinking evolution is true. And I sometimes wonder... If they are this abusive to a brother in Christ, how much worse are they to someone outside of the faith? If they treat me like this, and I'm we're on the same side. How are they how, how are they treating outsiders? It's something I really try not to think too much about. Um, there is a quote that goes like this. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Do you come off as someone who cares for unbelievers? Or do you come off as someone who just wants to fight? Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 says, quote, it, is too it is too light a thing that you 
should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Israel and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends uh, to the end of the earth. End quote. Okay, so here in Isaiah, we have a prophecy about the Messiah. Jesus would be a light for the Gentiles so that his, that is God's, salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. We know from passages like John 3.16 that God so loved the world, the world, that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Because as 1 Timothy 2.4 says, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Um, and as First Timothy two five to six goes on to say, for there is one God, uh, and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, as Second Peter three nine says. As already stated, Jesus is the light of the world prim uh, primarily. Jesus Jesus is the light of the world primarily. Jesus said this about himself in John chapter eight verse twelve. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 14, he says, we are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. We, we are the light of the world, and Jesus is the light of the world because we are to reflect his character in an, an analogous way uh, that the moon reflects the sun's light. And we're reflecting it, and we've been reflecting it to all of humanity for the past 2,000 years. Jesus' followers have been obeying the Great Commission he gave, uh, that he gave in Matthew 28, 19. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go therefore and preach the gospel to all creation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. I saw my little light up here go off and on. Did I go out for a second? I hope not. Anyway, Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. Proverbs 4.18. John 15, 8 says, This is to do my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. John 13, 35 says, All people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And so that is the end of the presentation. Slam our insight. Yes, you were refreshing for 20 seconds. Well, at least it was only 20 seconds lost. I don't, this has not been a good night, technologically speaking. I, I was beginning to think, oh my gosh, should I just call it off and do it again next week? Because I couldn't even get the slides to work correctly. But yeah, when, when I get, when I go this on playback, I am going to just snip that huge part out where I'm trying to fix the technological difficulties. And so that way people who watch this, who didn't watch this live, but are watching on playback, don't have to sit through all that. Uh, there is a way to do that in the, um, uh, in YouTube studio where you can take your streams and just snip parts out. Fortunately, and I guess I'll, ha I'll have to do that. It was brief. You're good. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad it was only 20 seconds that was lost. If it had been like five minutes, that would have been really bad. So if anyone, if anyone has um, any questions, Q&A, this is the Q&A period of the stream. Leave your uh, comment in the comment section like this. This is a comment. You can ask a question like, why did the slides not work right tonight? 
<laughs> what was going on? Um, or if, if you don't have any questions, then I'll just wrap it up. By the way, uh, like the video and subscribe. Um, next week, next Saturday, I will be uh, going into part three. Uh, what was part three? Oh, part three is Jesus's attitude towards the Old Testament law. Uh, does Jesus like require us to keep all, what was it, 600? I haven't, I don't have the number, 600 something Torah laws to memory. Um, some modern-day Judaizers use that verse to try to argue that we are bound, we are still under the law. And Jesus said, "I, you know, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. That's what I'm going to be talking about next week. Same time, same place, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on this channel. Uh, I recommend that you subscribe and turn on notifications you will be notified before it goes live but i'll also be sharing it all over social media um and uh, that way if you and if you show up live you'll have live interaction i mean you can always leave a comment in the comment section but you know you won't get a reply right away you may have to wait an hour or two hours or a day before i just happen to go on youtube see the notification bell and say like oh hey someone left a comment on my video but here on the stream if you show up live you'll get an answer right away the real steel cat says thanks for the stream uh well thanks for watching it um i'm current i'm still doing by the way i'm still doing some uh studying on the sermon on the mount even though this series has already started um i'm just because i don't have all of my slides prepared but i do have the next four weeks the slides prepared and uh, phil weingert uh he wrote the book the rabbi on the mount he recommended a book by david instrone brewer i just saw it on the cerebral faith uh, the cerebral faith facebook page today it's called uh divorce and remarriage in the church um i bought it on kindle today and i've been reading it all morning and all afternoon i've gotten to i've gotten through the first eight chapters i think there's 15 or or 19 maybe in total uh, I've gotten to nearly the 100th page. It's been really good so far, and uh, a couple of the a couple of the points that were in that book, I decided to add to the slide presentation I'm making on uh, on the divorce section because Jesus talks about divorce in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I also got a book called Sermon on the Mount, which is a it's, it's a series of sermons by John Wesley, and I just thought, well, I have to read this. Because there's two reasons. Number one, this is what I'm currently talking about on the web show. Secondly, it's John Wesley, one of the you know really big preachers and, and thinkers in uh, church history, relatively recent church history. He you know lived and did his ministry in the 1700s. Uh, it's still history. It's, uh, I, I think he died in like 17. I think. I asked my Echo Dot earlier when he died. He died in like 1779, but big name, founder, the founder of the Methodist Church. And I'm like, I got to read it. It's John Wesley. Slam RN says, thanks for good content at Cerebral Faith Video. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for thanking me. I appreciate the content, um, the comment, comment. The comment about the content. <laughs> so I guess that is all of the. Um, the questions that we're going to get tonight. So. One of these days I will learn to pull up the relationship manner uh, manager and just have it ready.
So I want to give a shout out to my patrons, David Shannon, Red Blade Flame, Steel Cat, Andre Melnick, Nathan Hamilton, Jordan Hampton, Brandon Whitaker, and David Parrish. And if you would like to support Cerebral Faith, uh, go to www.patreon.com slash Cerebral Faith. Uh, you will get access, early access to blog posts, or early access to, um, well, not really the podcast. I mean, you could get early access to the audio version of the podcast. I, I really want to ask about that because it's like, well, since the, the live web show and the podcast are now one and the same, are you really getting it early? You're getting early access to an MP3 file, tech, but really it's it's available while it is recording. It's available right now as I am doing it. So, uh, But you, you will get shout-outs on the podcast. You'll get um, shout-outs on the YouTube videos that are, you know, not just the live, not just the streams, but ones I edit and upload. Um, you'll get... If you're on the three dollar tier, you'll get all of my books in ebook format for free. Um, and yeah. So, and if you would like more apologetics contents, blogs, podcasts, and videos, check out www.cerebralfaith.net. Oh, speaking of uh, new videos, uh, I recently uploaded a new video today, uh, in which I show people how to navigate the website because I've gotten so many con uh, so many direct messages where people are like, uh, do you have any content on this subject? Do you have any articles on this subject? I'm like, well, yeah, didn't you go look? Uh, <laughs> apparently, like the website for a lot of people is just not intuitive and they have a hard time uh, managing maneuvering around it it's not quite as simple as it was back when it was on blogspot and so i thought you know what i'm just going to show i'm just going to have like a tutorial of how to navigate the website apparently i fell victim to the same thing that william lane craig's website fell into i found reasonablefaith.org the new version to be difficult to navigate for the longest time but now I think I've gotten used to it for the most part, although the search engine still isn't as effective as it once was. But yeah, I made a video showing people uh, how to navigate the website. That should be up in a few days. So if you ever had trouble finding things because it's just, you know, the way it's built, that will hopefully be helpful to you. Um, and be, by the way, be on the lookout for some videos on Zach Miller's channel, it's called, I think it's called What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. He's actually attended some of these live, uh, some of these Cerebral Faith Live episodes live and has put stuff in the live chat. Um, we did like maybe four or five videos on Genesis 1 defending the functional origins cosmic temple view uh, against, you know, cr critiques by several different Old Testament scholars. And they, he should be putting those up some point. I don't know um, when, but uh, I will share them on the Cerebral Faith Facebook page whenever they are available. And he has let me, he's given me permission to use the audio from those videos uh, on the Cerebral Faith podcast. They will probably be the last podcast episodes of this year. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, so that's all I've got for tonight. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in, uh, whether you are uh, attending live, watching this on YouTube, on playback, or listening to it on pure audio form uh, on Spotify, on the podcast, or wherever. Peace out, God bless, and keep using the brains that God gave you.